with uh, Troy Sadowski, and uh, he's coming to us live from his home in Georgia. We're glad to have him uh, with us today. Some of our guys have met him at the Ohio Men's Retreat, and uh, we've had an opportunity to sit down and talk to him a few times. And um, I just uh, wanted to have this opportunity to uh, let the rest of our folks kind of meet you from a distance and uh, hear what God's done in your life. But uh, Troy, why don't you just uh, give us a brief introduction to uh, what's going on in your life now, and then we'll kind of hit the rewind button a little bit and, uh, and take a look at what, what God's done for you in the past. All right, fantastic. Well, welcome. Thank you for, uh, for having me on. Uh, I'm looking forward to this. It was on my calendar and uh, always excited to be able to share what the Lord's done in my life. Uh, like you said, I'm here in Woodstock, Georgia, and my life, it seems like it's been put on hold. You know, we work with the foundation uh, and uh, a lot of the churches that we go with out and visit, they have put uh, a postpone on everything. Uh, and we're going to try to reschedule a later date. So I have been doing a lot of stuff around the house. I don't know uh, if you're familiar with uh, caulking and painting and priming the house. I had the opportunity. I was a one-man Polish painting crew, uh, and I painted my home. So uh, the downtime has allowed me to catch up on everything. Uh, but I look forward to getting back out, going around and uh, visiting churches and helping all the families that we can help. It, it's, it's definitely been a, a unique year for everybody, uh, I think, for sure. Um, Troy, let's hit the rewind button a little bit. I know that you come from a very athletic family. Uh, was it your dad or your uncle or somebody involved in Major League Baseball? Yes, sir. Uh, my dad and two uncles. They were Ed, Ted, and Bob. Bob being my dad, Sadowski, and they were three brothers that played professional baseball. We were a sports-minded family when I was growing up. Um, it was kind of like having a dad and a built-in coach all the time. Uh, but I, my, one of my earliest childhood memories, my dad was a pitcher, and we used to go down to Murphy Candler Park, and he would throw uh, baseballs to me. And the very first time I got in the batter's box, he buzzed an 85-mile-an-hour fastball right at me. I bailed. I got out of the batter's box, and he looked at me, and he goes, son, what are you doing? I said, dad, I don't want to get hit. He said, son, pain is temporary. Championships last forever. Get back in there. So I got back in there, and what do you think he did the very next pitch? He plunked me in the back with the ball. I hit the ground. I'm crying. Uh, I'm flopping around like a fish out of water. And he yells at me. He says, son, spit on it. Get back in there. <laughs> so I got up and got back on uh, the, the batter's box. And uh, those are some of the fondest memories. I mean, my, my dad was my hero when I was growing up. Uh, and those are some of the things that I – I uh, truly remember uh, I lost him about two years ago. Uh, so it, it's been uh, difficult since then uh, to lose your, your your dad, your friend, and the coach. Yeah, I, I can only imagine. Um, I know you, you live in Georgia, went to college in Georgia. Did you grow up in Georgia or did you kind of be in? I did. Uh, I was raised in the Shambly Dunwoody area. It's on the north side of the perimeter in Atlanta. Um, we, uh, when my dad uh, finished playing baseball, uh, that's how we ended up in Atlanta. Um, his last team was the Milwaukee Braves. Of course, they moved to Atlanta. And uh, he actually pitched the last game in Milwaukee, Milwaukee, wait, Milwaukee County Stadium. I believe it was a 5-0 to zero win. And that's how we ended up in the, uh, the Georgia area. And I've been here ever since. Cool. So growing up, were you a multi-sport athlete or did you focus on football solely or? I was a multi-sport athlete, foot, uh, football, baseball, basketball. Um, of course, uh, baseball was the, was the number one for us being a baseball family. And it was kind of a uh, selfish decision on my part uh, to choose football over baseball because I was always known as Bob Sadowski's son and I wanted to make a name for myself. And uh, so I chose football. Now, years later, uh, when he was uh, getting ill, uh, sick, and um, didn't quite sure how much time he was going to have left, him and I had a conversation, and I asked him, I said, did me choosing football, did that hurt you? And he said, absolutely not. You are your own man. You chose your sport. 
you chose your path and you did it extremely well. So he goes, I got no problems with that. Well, that's cool. So growing up, you, you kind of started focusing on football and, and at some point, I would assume you start getting noticed by some colleges, Georgia being one of them. Kind of walk us through, um, kind of walk us through your high school years and, and deciding on going to Georgia and, and then we'll kind of, kind of take it from there. All right. Um, I actually hated football when I was younger. Uh, I, I didn't understand why people wanted to do that, why they would put themselves through that. Uh, the baseball was dominant for me uh, in my backyard. I had a net put up. I put a tee up. I, my dad would come out and do soft toss with me. I'd hit off the tee. Uh, we lived really close to the field. We could go down to the field. But in high school, um, after my uh, ninth grade season, um, the football meeting was taking place. And I didn't attend the meeting. And the coaches contacted my dad, wanted to know why. Uh, and they said that he was going to concentrate on baseball. And they said, Bob, he, he needs to play football. So they convinced me into coming back out. And uh, what a blessing uh, that was uh, to, to get a chance to go back out. But um, my high school was really the first time that uh, uh, the Lord used somebody in my life. I mean, that, I'm sure he was using people, but that, that I can truly put my finger on that this was a person. Uh, and his name was Jim Cagle. He's my high school football coach. And he was pursuing me the very first day I walk into the high school. He was that Mark chapter two type of Christian, uh, the terror. And we all know the story. Uh, the, the, the paralyzed man that had the four friends, they got him to Jesus. They couldn't get inside because it was standing room only. Uh, there were no tickets uh, available. So they didn't stop him. They went on the roof. They, they, uh, tore a hole in the roof. They lowered their friend down, and uh, something amazing happened. The, you know, for one, Jesus was so moved by their faith through their actions that that miracle happened. That man's sins were forgiven, and he got up and walked off. So that was what Jim Cagle was. He was pursuing me from day one because he knew, hey, if we can get Troy Sadowski to Jesus Christ, something amazing can happen with his life. And uh, that's the first time that somebody was pursuing me and he was a, a head of the fellowship of Christian athletes. Uh, I didn't know a lot about fellowship of Christian athletes, except they were a bunch of Bible thumpers and, and I didn't want to go. And I turned him down for the longest time, but it didn't stop him. He continued to pursue me. And eventually I went and I was just going to check off the box. I just wanted to get him off my back. Uh, and I went and I'll tell you, pastor, that there were three main reasons why I went. Number one, there was going to be food. Number two, there was going to be desserts. And number three, I heard there were a lot of cute girls that attended the FCA event. So that is the honest truth of why I went. And I went, and it absolutely blew my mind. Here's a bunch of people that were just having food, fun, and fellowship. Uh, and the first time I've ever heard the gospel of Jesus Christ, and I chose to ignore it because I thought I was a know-it-all. Hmm. I didn't think I needed anybody telling me I needed Jesus Christ in my life. So how old were you at that point? I was probably a freshman. So what is that? Uh, 14 years old. Okay. I guess. So 14 year old young man living in the quote unquote Bible belt and had never heard the gospel clearly until that point. Well, I was raised Catholic. Okay. Uh, I mean, we weren't practicing Catholics by any means. We we went to church on special occasions and holidays. And, and when we went, uh, I'll be honest with you, I really didn't get anything out of it. Um, they quoted scripture. They talked about scripture. They read scriptures. Um, but for me, it was more um, theatrical. Okay. Church. And I, I don't want to sound like I'm bashing on the Catholic faith. But for Troy Sadowski, it was more theatrical than anything. And I really didn't get anything out of it. They talked about Jesus Christ, but they didn't talk about that personal relationship, that one-on-one -on -one intimate relationship that he desires to have with each and every one of us. Right. So was this coach, was he your coach your entire high school career? He was. Uh, his name was Jim Cagle. And... Uh, uh, a mountain of a man, him and I hit it off. I mean, he was that, 
uh, strength and conditioning coach and the athlete. He actually played at the University of Georgia as well and then got a few years in the National Football League with the Philadelphia Eagles. So we hit it off right from the start. Wow, that's, that's pretty, pretty amazing. So he had basically four years to have an opportunity to influence you and, and be an example to you, uh, you know, during, during your whole high school career. Um, and, and I'm assuming there would be more opportunities down that road to hear the gospel throughout your high school year as well, right? There was. I mean, I, I was as lost as a duck in the desert. Uh, it would go in one ear and right out the other. Uh, I just, I, I really thought that I knew everything and that everything was going fantastic in my life. I'm a, a four-star athlete being recruited by most of the Division One schools across the country. Uh, I didn't need somebody telling me that I needed something else in my life. Mm. Wow, that's amazing. So what, what led you to decide to, to decide on Georgia? Obviously, you, you lived in Georgia, but were you had you been a, a Bulldogs fan or? Being in, a, 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 in the Georgia area, uh, staying close to home was very important. My mom was diagnosed with breast cancer, and uh, she was getting into the advanced stages, and it was starting to spread. So it was very important to me to stay at home so my mom could see me play. Uh, she actually was a graduate of the University of Georgia, uh, but that uh, motivation of her being able to see me uh, play football was one of the driving forces why I decided to stay local. And um, she was able to see, uh, I was redshirted my first year. I broke my thumb, had to have surgery and they put pins in it so I couldn't play, which is actually a blessing because it gave me a chance to get stronger, uh, faster and quicker. And then my redshirt freshman year, uh, she got to see a full, complete season uh, before she passed. Mm -hmm. Wow. So if I remember correctly, there was somebody there at the University of Georgia that God used in your life as well. Is that correct? Yes, sir. That was a, a position coach. Uh, he and his wife, Charlie and Debbie Whittemore, uh, godly people. Um, you know, it's amazing looking back. I really didn't realize what I had in front of me until I was later saved. And then what incredible people the Lord used in my life. And we all have read through the Bible and the way that the Lord used people in our lives uh, and in other people's lives was pretty incredible. And um, that's back when the coaches, they could actually invest time with the, the, the players. I mean, being a student athlete was difficult. Well, we were able to uh, go off the field and do things with the Whittemore family. I mean, we would go to their house. We'd have cookouts. We could go to church with them. We could go to Bible studies. We could do all these things. But now they deem that as improper benefits. So they don't do that. And I think that's one of the problems that we have in college sports today is, is that these coaches don't have the ability to pour more of themselves into these players. Uh, a lot of these coaches have been there, done that. They've seen everything they've done everything and they've been in those positions where the players are uh, but yet they're kind of handcuffed in a certain way that they can't pour more into them but Charlie uh, Coach Whittemore did that and that was the second time in my life that the uh, gospel of Jesus Christ was presented to me and I thought I was the big man on campus uh, I had early success in my career at the University of Georgia and um, I remember going to an economics class and then reading the role and it took forever to get down the roll. Well, but when they got to my name, they call out Troy Sadowski, and the whole class turns around to look at me because they heard me on TV, they, they watched the game, they saw me. Now, this was their first opportunity to see me in person, so they turned around, and I ate that up. That's one of the things that Satan does. He uses the things that are in our lives that um, are the closest and most dearest and, and and he made that situation at the University of Georgia look so good, I bought into it hook, line, and sinker. Mm. I thought I was the big man on campus. Boy, was I wrong. <laughs> and so uh, the, the enemy used that to his advantage. Absolutely. And, and, and uh, he got that big hook in my mouth. And, um, and I did all the things that I shouldn't have been doing. I thought that a student athlete was somebody that played football that they ate the food on the campus, they went to class, um, they just did enough to get by, um, they partied, 
and, and you can imagine uh, Athens, Georgia. Uh, it, it's a it's a wonderful city. It's a uh, a campus of about thirty two thousand students, and all the bars and nightclubs and uh, sororities and fraternities. You can imagine uh, the snares and and traps that. Uh, Satan can put out that would lure you in, and and again, I, I did all that. I, sure. I, that's what a student athlete did, and again, I was completely wrong. So you were uh, played for Georgia for four years. Were you there? I did. Uh, I actually uh, became All Conference and All American tight end. Was actually the University of Georgia's first All American tight end in the history of the school. Um, the pretty neat thing is is in the tight end meeting room on the back of the wall is a big mural of me playing. Mm. Uh, so I got to make sure that I, uh, I do the right things with the university so they don't paint over my mural. <laughs> I hear you. Well, I've got some friends that are pretty big Bulldog fans. So I'm hoping they'll be watching this later on in the week when we post it. But um, one of the things that I was curious about was what, what time frame was that? Was that in the, um, 84. Okay. Yeah. 1984. So what was you guys' best season during those years? We were right after the Herschel Walker, uh, era. He, he was there 80 through 82. Um, I would say nine and three, uh, that we, we played one last game and they do now, uh, and nine and three was our best record. Uh, there was numerous times that we broke, uh, the top five. Uh, but that was earlier in the season. And, of course, you had the teams like Florida, Alabama, and Auburn. Uh, those were our uh, rival games. Sure. And, of course, had a his history of um, having great football as well. Yeah. So after your career there at Georgia, uh, you entered the draft and, and got drafted. Who, who did you originally – Kind of walk us through that that next chapter. I got drafted by the Atlanta Falcons, 145th overall, which was really neat because being the the Shambly boy in Atlanta that went to the University of Georgia, he gets drafted by his local uh, professional team, which was the Atlanta Falcons, and I played there for my first two years, and um, it, it was quite a ride. Everything that I was doing in college, I brought with me to the NFL my party life, my off the field life. Don't get me wrong, my on the field life was fantastic. My school was fantastic. It was my off the field life that was the big problem. Um, I like to look back and, and I was a runaway freight train that with all the sharp hills and turns in life, it was just a matter of time before my train was gonna derail. And that happened to me in 1994 in Cincinnati, Ohio, the Cincinnati Bengals. Um, everything that I was doing in college, I brought with me to the NFL. It was easier because in college, I had to find money to spend to go party. The NFL is playing me a king's ransom to play a kid's game so I could fund my own stuff, and I didn't have to worry about that. So I brought all that in there, carried all that baggage with me, and uh, it eventually caught up to me and my, my wife, my first wife, um, she left me. She went back home. Uh, she called me up to let me know why she was leaving. And the first thing that I did is I got angry. I got mad. I started pointing the finger and blaming people. I blamed everybody but myself. Um, she left. It was a very dark time in my life. And that's when the Lord used the third person in my life, his name was Ken Moyer. He was an offensive lineman with the Cincinnati Bengals. Uh, it's amazing. The Lord can even use an offensive lineman. <laughs> <laughs> but um, he can see that there's something was wrong with me. And he came up to me and sat down in my locker and he said, are you okay? And I said, man, I'm fantastic. I lied to him. Easiest way out. Um, one of the things that I did was I kept people at arm's length and it, that allowed me to live my double life that I was living, keep everybody at arm's length away from me. If you got too close, I'd shut you down because I didn't want anybody finding out what I was doing. Um, 
but he could see there was something wrong. I put my smile on, my happy face, and I went to work, but he could see right through that. And he invited me to go out to dinner. We went to dinner. I started going to uh, men's groups, prayer breakfast. And again, um, nothing ever sank in. Nothing ever meant anything to me because I'm just checking boxes. And that's one of the things in the world today. People just go through life checking boxes and they don't make a difference in life. Uh, and, and that's what exactly what I was doing. And that was the third time in my life that the gospel of Jesus Christ was presented to me. And then I chose to ignore it. I really thought that, uh, you know, I, I had made it to the, the NFL and I didn't have to worry about anything. And I didn't need somebody telling me this. Although down inside, I knew that there was something wrong. I was really great at making friends but I was just as good at running them off. But yeah, you were talking about the uh, the third guy that had kind of kind of reached out to you, and uh, yeah, Ken, you had Ken Moyer. Ken uh, Moyer. He um, was the third person that he used uh, the Lord used in my life, and uh, you know, and I would come to work and, and put a smile on, like everything was fantastic, and he could see right through it, and. Um, so that was the third time I denied Christ. Hmm. So you were going to, you said that he had invited you out to go a few places and that kind of thing. Um, did that kind of just wane off at some point or? It did because um, uh, I got released by the Bengals. Okay. To the uh, Pittsburgh Steelers um, from that point. And so we had talked on the phone, but we really lost touch when it came to that. Uh, that's one of the good things about social media is that you have these outlets in front of you now. You can keep in touch with people. Uh, so I keep in touch with people through social media a lot of times. But uh, yeah, we did. We lost. Uh, we lost contact when it when it came to all the other stuff. So at what point uh, did you finally surrender? to uh to christ kind of kind of take us through that journey you, you, you ended up going to the steelers and then kind of what what happened from there the uh the fourth person that the lord brought into my life was a gentleman by the name of buddy harris uh buddy harris was a general contractor by day and by night he was a professional wrestler uh, i told you the lord can use anybody yeah. <laughs> even yeah. a professional wrestler but um he was playing softball at a, uh for the uh First Baptist Church of Woodstock men's softball team. And he asked me if I wanted to come play. And I'm thinking to myself, why would I want to go do that? I'm a professional football player. Why would I want to go play softball with a bunch of 40, 50, 60 year old men that are trying to relive their youth through this church softball league? Uh, all they're going to do is ask questions about my, uh, my sports career and everything. Why would I want to do that? So I, I didn't go. And again, remember, tear off the roof type of Christian. He continued to ask me until I came. So I went. And uh, it was the most amazing experience in my life. Here were a bunch of 40, 50, 60-year-old men that were using the church softball league as a community outreach. The, we live in a lost and dying world, and they use this as an opportunity to ask me questions about Troy Sadowski, the person, not Troy Sadowski, the athlete. And that blew me away because I was used to people wanting me to come around so they could use me to hear my sports stories and things. So um, next step was they asked me to come to church and I went. But before I went, uh, I had to study the pastor. I needed to know what I was getting myself into. Well, I had heard about Dr. Johnny Hunt, that he was this little fireball preacher um, that says that he's six foot five. He's just wound really tight. He's five <laughs> ten. Um, and I went and I heard him speak. And the first time that I heard him, I sat on the back row. I didn't want him to be too close to me. I didn't want to make eye contact with him. And uh, he preached for 45 minutes. And everything that he talked about dealt directly with me and my life and everything that I was going through. 
and I'll be honest with you, Pastor, it it freaked me out because I'm thinking to myself, how does this guy who doesn't know me, how does he know so much about me? He's got to be following me around. Maybe it's one of those deacons. We all know the deacons. <laughs> Maybe he's sending deacons to follow me. I went and I heard him four times. And on the fourth time I heard him. In the Catholic Church, they don't have the altar call. They don't have an invitation, so to speak. They want you to, to go to confession and go to speak to somebody. Um, in the, the church, there was an altar call. And the first previous times I was there, I'm, I'm watching people get up and walk down. And I'm saying to myself, why are they doing this? Why are they getting up and walking down at the end of church? Why are they doing this? Because all they're doing is exposing themselves. They're showing, they're, 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 they're the church is going to rust a judgment. Because remember, everybody in there is a hypocrite, correct? <laughs> <laughs> why would these people want to do that to themselves this is self-inflicted uh punishment for them to do that there's no way i would do that the fourth time i heard the gospel uh the, the johnny hunt preach i got up and walked down i had no idea why i was getting up i just knew that i had this feeling inside of me that that little indian preacher at the end of the the, 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 the walkway had something for me and I needed to get to him. So I got down to him and I looked at him and I said, pastor, I said, you don't know me. I don't know you, but I've been sitting on the back row for the last four weeks listening to you. And you know what he said to me? I seen you back there. <laughs> so when you think you're getting something by on your pastor, <laughs> pastors are like, Jedi Knights, like Yoda, you know, they know all, they see all, you're not getting anything by on them. And uh, he paired me up with an altar counselor by the name of Vic Smith. We went in the back, we talked, we laughed, we talked, we cried, and we prayed, and I accepted Jesus Christ into my life. I knew that there was a problem. And I figured out that problem was me. Wow. Was this while you were still playing? I was. It was uh, my final couple of years in Pittsburgh and Jacksonville. Uh, you know, I, I became a new Christian at that time. And I, I knew the very first thing that I needed to do was I needed to get plugged in with other Christian brothers and sisters. Um, I really do believe that iron sharp. I lost you. No, I'm here. Oh, you're there. All yeah. right. I see you. But, um, I, I thought it was really important to get plugged in with my Christian brothers and sisters so that I could have like-minded people be surrounded by like-minded people because I didn't trust myself. Right. I mean, that bridge, I had to blow it up. Mm. I didn't trust myself to not cross back over it. So I, I needed to blow that bridge up. And uh, from that point on, it's just been an unbelievable ride. And uh, Two years ago, I had the opportunity in Cincinnati to go back to the, uh, the Free Will Baptist uh, National Convention. It was in Cincinnati. That's the place where my train jumped off the tracks. Uh, I had a chance to go back there and share my testimony on uh, Tuesday evening at the uh, – the youth and young adult uh, service, which was awesome uh, to have that opportunity. It was really bittersweet. Uh, and I think it was a reminder uh, from God that, Troy, look how far I brought you. Mm. That's awesome. What, what you say blowing that bridge up, you're talking about the bridge of the connections that. To go back to the, the life that I was living. Yeah. When I got saved, I did a 180 degree sprint in the opposite direction. Uh, but I didn't trust myself to not creep back to doing the things that I used to do. 
and, and I didn't want to do that. Um, I was on a, a 31 year losing streak mm. and, and uh, I, I didn't want to go back there. Wow. Well, praise God for his mercy and his long suffering and patience. Uh, I know that I can thank him for being patient and long suffering with me more on multiple occasions as you have, you, as you have shared. Um, and I think about that passage about God giving us back the years the locust have eaten. And, um, you know, the fact that our past doesn't, our past is still there, but God gives us such an abundant life and, and something so much to look forward to and the hope that we have for eternity when, when our lives are surrendered to Christ that, that we don't have to live in the past any longer and we don't have to let the past control us. And that, that was one of the things I felt, you know, in life, we've all heard this reference that you, you carry your baggage with you. Um, I was lugging that heavy baggage throughout my life. And the beautiful thing was when I accepted Christ into my life, uh, he threw that baggage away. Mm -hmm. I no longer carry that baggage. Uh, it was heavy, cumbersome, and, uh, what a what an amazing friend we have in Jesus. Yes. What would you want to say to somebody that's carrying that baggage right now? That you don't have to. I, I know there's a lot of stuff that's going on in, in, in the world today and in people's lives, uh, but we really have a true friend in Jesus Christ. I gave him a million reasons to not love me and none of them changed his mind. Mm -hmm. So whatever you're going through, whatever you're feeling, wherever you are, if it's that low point, uh, Jesus Christ is the one constant in our lives. He's somebody that you can turn to and will get rid of all that. Your slate will be white, crystal clear and clean. Yeah. It's amazing. Yeah. What a wonderful message of hope in such a dismal year. <laughs> we still have hope, right? <laughs> Even in 2020. <laughs> well, you know, and, and, and that, that, that's one of the things is, uh, you know, um, there's a lot going on. There's a lot of uncertainty. Certainty uh, makes people nervous and scared. Um, the creator of everything is sitting on his throne. Mm -hmm. Nothing that has happened in 2020 has taken him by surprise. Right. Very, very true. Well, Troy, I really appreciate you taking time to, to share what God's done in your life with us today. And I appreciate uh, every time I get a chance to see you for a little while, whether it's at the men's retreat or at a national or wherever it may be, you're always a gracious person. And uh, I appreciate you taking the time to, to be with us and maybe one of these days you can get up to Erie and, and share with our people about the foundation and, and, uh, and, uh, come back to your old stomping grounds a little North of Pittsburgh. So <laughs> that, that would, that would be fantastic. I would, I would really love to do that. And, uh, I'll, I'll touch base with you over the next couple of weeks and we'll go ahead and start looking for 2021. All right. God bless you, my friend. I appreciate you. Thank you. Appreciate you too. Love you. All right. Stay in touch. Love you, brother. Bye-bye.